In the video game industry, countless companies have come and gone, but one company has managed to outlast its competition at nearly every turn, Nintendo. For over three decades, Nintendo has beaten its rivals by pursuing its own singular vision of bold hardware innovations and games of unmatched creativity. It hasn't always been smooth sailing, though. Along the way, Nintendo's choices as a company have thrilled and baffled gamers. But through all their ups and downs, Nintendo's impact on the industry simply cannot be overstated. Amazingly, Nintendo might never have been so successful if it weren't for one character. Popeye. Yes, that Popeye. In the late 19th century in Kyoto, Japan, artist Fusajiro Yamauchi had developed great skill at the making and painting of Hanufuda, Japanese playing cards that were intricately detailed with beautiful and colorful imagery. By 1894, Yamauchi opened up his own Hanafuda manufacturing business. He called his new company Nintendo Kopai. Nintendo roughly translates as leave luck to heaven, a great expression when playing games of chance. The company's cards became so popular that Yamauchi had to hire assistants to help him move from handmade Hanafuda to mass production. In 1929, Yamauchi's son-in-law, Sekiro, took over the business. One of Sekiro's most important acts was the creation of Nintendo's own distribution network, a vital piece of the puzzle that would serve the company well over the next several decades. By 1949, his great-grandson Hiroshi took over and began to move it into the modern era. While business for the company was going smoothly, something happened to Yamauchi during a visit to the United States that changed Nintendo forever. Author Jeff Ryan's 2011 book, Super Mario, How Nintendo Conquered America, provides an in-depth account of Nintendo's beginnings. As the book describes, Yamauchi took a meeting with Disney executives to license their characters for Nintendo cards. Seeing the vastness of Disney's empire firsthand revealed just how huge a global entertainment company could become. Yamauchi knew he would never settle for less than worldwide success. In an interview with Machinima, author Jeff Ryan explains that Yamauchi's coming of age as Japan lost the Second World War gave the man a hard edge, one that would drive him in business for the rest of his life. He came out of World War II and he was from the Japanese side, so he was one of the, it was the whole greatest generation thing mixed in with the fact that his side had lost and he was running his grandfather's company and he needed to make a lot of tough decisions and for about 30 years he was making decisions that didn't quite play out but every time he tried something he would learn from the failure mostly he would learn well we don't do that again in 1963 the business's name changed to simply the nintendo company limited a move reflecting its expansion into other ventures However, the company's card-making experience helped it break into one business, toys. Author Jeff Ryan explains how Nintendo transitioned from cards to toys with the help of its existing distribution network. Trading cards kept on making money, but it was a small amount of money. He realized that there was a distribution network that was valuable beyond just the cards that they were selling, because that allowed him, if he wanted to make a toy, he could get it into every toy store in Japan, which was something that a normal toy manufacturer starting from scratch can't do. Its first toy was the Ultra Hand, an extendable arm invented by Gunpei Yokoi, a maintenance worker from Nintendo's card-making factories. Yokoi had originally created the Ultra Hand for his own amusement, but Yamauchi saw Yokoi's potential. The toy went to market in 1970, selling 1.2 million units. Nintendo was officially in the toy business. Other products followed, Yokoi's creativity leading the charge. The 10 billion barrel was an innovative marble puzzle, while the Love Tester was an electronic passion measuring device that could only come from Japan. Through the 70s, Nintendo also tested Japan's video game market, releasing arcade games and Pong clone TV consoles. In 1979, they scored their biggest hit, Radar Scope, a Space Invaders imitator. In 1980, Nintendo released another Yokoi invention, the handheld Game & Watch. Inspired by the LCD screens of pocket calculators, Yokoi's invention was simple but addictive, and kept Nintendo heading towards the electronic entertainment business. That year, Yamauchi sought expansion into America. 
To set up Nintendo's American branch, the chairman tapped son-in-law, Minero Arakawa, who was living in Vancouver with Yamauchi's daughter, Yoko. The Arakawa set up shop at a warehouse in Elizabeth, New Jersey. To get the ball rolling, their first game would be their Japanese hit, Radar Scope. 3,000 cabinets shipped from Japan. Arakawa's attempts to sell the game didn't go well. He only managed to move a third of their supply, leaving about 2,000 machines sitting in the warehouse. Worse, Radar Scope wasn't scoring well with the arcade owners, who preferred games from proven names like Namco or the arcade king, Atari. The fledgling Nintendo of America had only broken even on the venture so far. They needed a new, inexpensive game, and soon. While his father-in-law looked at his staff in Kyoto for ideas, the Arakawas moved back to the Pacific Northwest. Yamauchi was no fool. He knew better than to commit too many resources to what was turning into a losing proposition. So instead of pulling one of Nintendo's proven designers from other projects, he solicited ideas from his entire company, hoping to make an unexpected discovery within his company. Discover he did. Shigeru Miyamoto, a 29-year-old staff artist, piqued Yamauchi's interest. Miyamoto was teamed with Gampai Yokoi, who would help turn the new designer's ideas into reality. The two would use a conversion kit to transform those unsold radar scopes into something new. But before they began, they hit a snag. Yamauchi's wanted to base a game on a popular character to spur sales. It just so happened that a new Hollywood movie based on Popeye was in production. And 20 years earlier, Nintendo had released a ramen product based on the spinach-eating sailor. Yamauchi believed acquiring the rights would be a cinch, but weren't available after all. Miyamoto was undeterred. Already on course for a great new game, all he had to do was tweak the characters a bit. Olive oil was made into the generic lady, while Bluto devolved into the giant, stubborn ape he'd always resembled. And Popeye would leave the Navy and become a carpenter. That love triangle featured in Popeye's cartoons and comic strips informed these new characters and set players off on a quest to rescue the damsel in distress. The story of the new game was a great hook, but no one would pump quarters into a game that didn't play well. Fortunately, Miyamoto happened to be a game-designing genius, a fact no one, not even himself, had realized until he'd gotten the job. Gone was Radar Scope's derivative alien shooting mechanic. This new game wouldn't have any shooting at all. Instead, players would have to direct the in-game avatar safely up a construction site to rescue the kidnapped lady, jumping over barrels and finding scattered hammers to clear away threats. This new jump man, as Miyamoto called him, offered a new way to play, and the development team knew it would be special. As for the game's title, Miyamoto looked to Japan and America's shared history of gigantic movie monsters. King Kong, of course, was the biggest ape around. But this was no king. This ape was not only stubborn, but like Bluto, pretty stupid. More like an ass, or a donkey. Donkey Kong had a name. But they still needed names for the other two characters. Lady would be named Pauline, in thanks to their kind warehouse manager, Don James, whose wife's name was Polly. The game's hero, however, was named after the warehouse's owner, James's hot-headed boss, Mario Siegel. Arakawa and his small team started hand-converting radar scope cabinets to Donkey Kong machines. In 1981, Arakawa put the test machines in two Seattle bars, and they took off like radar scope never did. The machines earned more than $30 a day in quarters, prompting Arakawa to install more machines. Soon enough, the cabinets each made Nintendo $200 a week. Arakawa and his team converted the rest of the 2000 radar scope cabinets by hand, and began manufacturing hundreds of new Donkey Kong machines to keep up with the growing demand. Soon enough, there were 60,000 Donkey Kong machines in operation throughout North America that year. Nintendo had arrived, and it was all thanks to the inspiration of Popeye the Sailor Man and Miyamoto's genius. Nintendo exploded onto the arcade scene and brought success Yamauchi had known would one day be his. But in addition to growing into a bigger business, Nintendo had also grown into a bigger target. As 1981 drew to a close, over 60,000 Donkey Kong arcade cabinets dotted North America. By 1982, Nintendo manufactured up to 50 cabinets per day. In its first year in the US, Donkey Kong earned $180 million for Nintendo. In its next year, the barrel-throwing ape earned another $100 million launching Nintendo into the video game stratosphere. 
In July 1982, Nintendo of America bought 27 acres in Redmond, saying goodbye to the warehouse in Tukwila, Washington, that was owned by Jumpman's namesake, Mario Siegel. Riding high on Donkey Kong's success, Nintendo was gearing up to bring the arcade into customers' homes. But not only would they soon face monkey business in the courtroom, Nintendo would once again face an uphill battle to sell America on its latest product. Soon their success in the States would seem like nothing more than a pipe dream. But sometimes... As Donkey Kong guzzled quarters across America in 1981, its creator Shigeru Miyamoto set up to work on a sequel. In 1982, Nintendo released Donkey Kong Jr., a follow-up as unconventional as its predecessor. Instead of keeping Mario in the position of the hero, Miyamoto decided to cast him as the villain, having cruelly locked Donkey Kong in a cage at the top of the screen. Playing the role of the hero this time was Donkey Kong's son, who climbed vines and chains while dodging toothsome enemies to save his father. Despite the potentially blasphemous switcheroo of making Mario the antagonist, Miyamoto had scored again. Donkey Kong Jr. managed to sell over 30,000 cabinets. Donkey Kong was a force to be reckoned with. The brand's success paved the way for another lucrative opportunity for Nintendo, licensing and merchandising. Console maker Coleco gained the rights to make a home version of the game. And outside of video games, Nintendo found that Donkey Kong's face looked good on everything. Board games, stuffed animals, and more. But to MCA Universal, the movie studio behind 1976's King Kong feature film, Donkey Kong simply looked like an ever-growing dollar sign. After countless threats of legal action and after scoring multi-million dollar settlements with nearly every Donkey Kong license, Universal filed suit against Nintendo on June 26, 1982. The studio alleged that Donkey Kong infringed on their King Kong copyright. The video game maker, however, refused to budge. The case went to trial in early 1983, and Nintendo prevailed with ease. Its lawyers, led by attorney John Kirby, established the many differences between the conflicting Kongs. But if this weren't enough for the judge, Kirby proved that, in fact, Universal hadn't a legal leg to stand on. In 1975, the studio had sued previous King Kong picture maker RKO Pictures, and had itself proven that King Kong was in the public domain. The result of the 75 case cleared the way for Universal's 76 film remake. It also caused the judge to throw the suit against Nintendo out of court in 83. Nintendo had taken on the powerhouses of American entertainment and emerged victorious. While Nintendo of America defended itself in court, Nintendo in Japan had released its next big product, the Nintendo Family Computer, or the Famicom. According to Jeff Ryan's Super Mario How Nintendo Conquered America, Nintendo President Hiroshi Yamauchi had the Famicom in the works for years. The 8-bit home console featured two wired controllers with raised directional pads and two face buttons a design that had originated with Gunpai Yokoi's Game & Watch. In July 1983, the Famicom was released in Japan with ports of Nintendo's American hits, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and the game that finally realized Yamauchi's vision, Popeye, a title that shared plenty in common with, what else, Donkey Kong. Nintendo finally wrangled the rights to the Sailor Man who had inspired Nintendo's biggest hit. That year, Nintendo sold over a half a million Famicoms, the next year, it shattered that number by moving 3 million consoles. Nintendo had another hit on its hands, and the next step was to bring it to the US. But there was one problem. In 1983, the American video game market had crashed, a consequence of too many overpriced and underwhelming systems competing with each other. Game developers sprang up like mushrooms, creating unauthorized and often lousy games for the many consoles on the market. By 1984, the idea of a home video game system was anathema to American audiences and retailers alike. Once again, Nintendo of America's president, Minoru Arakawa, had an uphill battle selling the systems in the States. The fact that, by 1985, the Famicom had sold over 19 million units in Japan didn't impress American retailers still smarting over the money they'd lost on video games so recently. So instead of trying to sell a game system, why not try to sell a toy? Nintendo tried to hide the console's true nature, packaging it with a toy robot, the Robotic Operating Buddy, or Rob, along with games Gyromite and Stack Up. No one was fooled and the plan didn't work. Yamauchi ordered Arakawa and his team to sell the systems to New York toy stores personally. Arakawa followed Yamauchi's bidding, but went a step further. According to Ryan's book, Arakawa went over Yamauchi's head, 
assuring retailers that they could get full refunds on any unsold systems, a gutsy move that could have cost Nintendo dearly. Fortunately, Arakawa's gamble paid off and 50,000 units sold in New York. Similar rollouts in other major cities over the next few months yielded similar results. By 1986, Nintendo was finally able to release the Famicom, now named the Nintendo Entertainment System, nationally. It didn't hurt that it came packed with one of the most incredible games yet, Shigeru Miyamoto's Super Mario Bros. Before Nintendo devoted most of its resources to the Famicom and NES, Miyamoto kept working on arcade games. He had spun Mario off into his own game in 1983, Mario Brothers took place in a pipe-filled sewer, where the pair worked together to knock out as many turtles and crabs as they could. When Miyamoto was promoted to make Famicom games, he took Mario with him. The result was like nothing seen before. A whole kingdom full of secrets, growth-inducing mushrooms, warp zones, stompable enemies, and, of course, lots of pipes. Super Mario Brothers' 1985 debut was a massive success driving the system sales and hooking American gamers in ways the Atari and ColecoVision never could. To date, Super Mario Bros. is said to have sold more than 40 million copies worldwide, holding the record for the best-selling video game for a full 18 years. Miyamoto kept working, creating another masterpiece inspired by his childhood spent roaming the woods and caves in Kyoto. February 1986's The Legend of Zelda, a questing game, featured even deeper exploration than Super Mario Bros. Clearly, Zelda's grand scope and massive dungeons touched something within gamers, and Nintendo had another hit. Other now legendary games followed, like the lonely, haunting space adventure Metroid, designed by Yokoi. That title blew people's minds with the end-of-game revelation that its silent protagonist, Samus Aran, was actually a woman. However, a console can't survive on first-party games alone. Third-party developers were contracted to develop new titles for the NES, but Nintendo's new machine featured a lockout chip that only Nintendo could supply. The chip drove up the costs of production, and games lacking the chip wouldn't play. Nintendo had control. While the chips ensured quality NES games, the way Nintendo lorded them over its third-party developers guaranteed an unhealthy relationship. In fact, a 1988 chip shortage led to just that. Author Jeff Ryan explains how Nintendo handled the shortage. Nintendo decided to ration the chips, which was in one way the only thing they could do. There's, there's not enough supply to meet the demand, so therefore you only give some to everyone. Now, they gave themselves as many chips in the world, but for something like Konami or Capcom, they wouldn't make more than 100,000 copies of a game, and this is a game that could sell millions. And if Konami or Capcom complained, Nintendo would, would maybe cut their order even more so they'd only have 90,000. Despite Nintendo's strained relationship with third parties, its relationship to gamers was only getting stronger, thanks largely to Shigeru Miyamoto's continued brilliance, though he wasn't infallible. In fact, his 1986 follow-up to the original Super Mario Bros never saw release in the United States, as it was deemed too challenging. It had all the familiar hallmarks of the original game, but harder. Some mushrooms made Mario super, but some mushrooms actually killed him. Nintendo of America thought it was more sadistic than satisfying. But Super Mario needed a sequel, so Miyamoto oversaw production on converting another game, Yumi Kojo Doki Doki Panic, into a new Mario title. Gone was the Mushroom Kingdom and Bowser, in their place was Subcon, a dream world players had to free from the clutches of Wart, an evil frog. And instead of jumping on enemies to stomp them, players could ride them, pick them up, and toss them at other bad guys. Besides the picture on the box, there wasn't much tying the game in with Super Mario. Fortunately for Nintendo, fans were more than happy to explore the world of Subcon. Super Mario Bros. 2 sold over 7 million copies in its 1988 North American debut. Miyamoto still wanted a proper sequel, though. His next project was a true continuation for Super Mario that would both bring the game back to its roots while moving the series forward by leaps and bounds. The result was Super Mario Bros. 3. Players encountered the familiar mechanics of jumping and stomping that made the original game so great, while contending with new powers and abilities. Super Mario Bros. 3 was everything people loved about the first game, but better. And in 1989, as its North American debut drew near, Nintendo of America was approached by Universal Pictures, the same studio that had sued them over Donkey Kong's alleged copyright infringements. 
The studio's plans for a big screen version of The Jetsons was delayed, and they needed a project to appeal to kids around the holidays. The result was The Wizard, a movie starring Fred Savage and Christian Slater, depicting two brothers' journeys across the country on a quest to win a video game tournament. And the game featured at the tournament itself? None other than Super Mario Bros. 3, which made its North American debut in multiplexes across the country. While The Wizard isn't remembered as much more than an afterthought, Super Mario Bros. 3's release in February 1990 found its place in the history books. It was Nintendo's biggest hit yet, selling 18 million copies and achieving the record for the best-selling video game not bundled with a system. As it began the 1990s, Nintendo had been transformed since its tentative entrance into the video game market a decade before. Instead of simply being a player in the industry, Nintendo practically owned it. The company seemed invincible. But soon enough, Nintendo would discover the price for not playing well with others. By the late 1980s, Nintendo seemed to have sewn up the video game industry across the globe. The Nintendo Entertainment System was a staple of the American family room, and Super Mario was a household name, starring in three hit games, several cartoons, and appearing on every product Nintendo could license. But in 1987, NEC released the PC Engine in Japan, a 16-bit competitor to Nintendo's 8-bit Famicom. A year later in 1988, Sega released their 16-bit Mega Drive console. Nintendo couldn't rest on its laurels and remained the dominant force in video games. Ironically, Nintendo's next big idea was a bit on the small side. Gunpei Yokoi's handheld Game & Watch LCD toys was one of Nintendo's earliest successes in the video game industry. But the future was clearly consoles, and Yokoi had been working on a portable version of the Famicom for years. Replicating the bright, colorful animation of most home consoles would require a backlight and a big drain on the device's battery life, not to mention pricey manufacturing costs. To keep costs down and batteries up, the system would skip color altogether. Yokoi's final design was finished and released as the Game Boy in April 1989. The 8-bit two-button console took four AA batteries that lasted for at least 10 hours, all for about $90. While the Game Boy's monochromatic greenish display wasn't much to look at, and couldn't be seen at all in the dark, it gave consumers one of the most successful pack-in titles yet, Tetris, an addictive Russian puzzle game for which Nintendo had purchased the console rights. It proved to be so addictive, in fact, that Nintendo sold out of its initial run of a million Game Boy units in mere weeks of its release, likely on the strength of Tetris alone. Estimates pegged Tetris's sales on the Game Boy at over 30 million copies to date, a few months later in September, Atari released its rival handheld, the backlit, full-color, 16-bit Lynx. It didn't stand a chance. The Lynx may have been more powerful, but as Yokoi knew, that power came at a cost. The Lynx's six AA batteries could only provide power for roughly half the time of the Game Boy, while selling for more than twice as much, ringing up at $190. The choice for consumers was clear, and the Game Boy was a massive success. Though Sega's 8-bit Game Gear released a year later had fared better than the Lynx, the Game Boy was already a runaway train that couldn't be caught. It easily outlasted its competition, selling nearly 119 million units in its unprecedented 14-year life cycle. The fact that the Game Boy boasted Nintendo's exclusive properties only solidified its position as the handheld leader. Shortly after the system's debut, Nintendo published Super Mario Land, a new title produced by Yokoi himself. Mario left the Mushroom Kingdom for a place called Sarasaland. Instead of rescuing Princess Toadstool from King Koopa, Mario fought a mysterious spaceman named Tatanga to rescue Princess Daisy. But, of course, the differences didn't matter. Mario jumped and stomped his way to 18.4 million sales. Other famous names appeared on the Game Boy. Yokoi brought his lonely space adventure back from Metroid 2 The Return of Samus in 1992, and Shigeru Miyamoto's The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening was published a year later. But not every Game Boy star came from the NES first. In 1992, a Nintendo-sponsored developer, HAL Laboratory, created a new platformer called Kirby's Dreamland, which starred a flying pink puffball who could swallow up enemies like a vacuum cleaner. And just as Mario was named after Nintendo's landlord, Kirby was named for John Kirby the ace attorney who defended the company in Universal's 1983 Donkey Kong lawsuit. Even though Nintendo was handily winning the battle for handhelds, the home console war was heating up. 
Though the Famicom was king in Japan, by 1990 Sega's 16-bit Genesis, the American name for the Mega Drive, was making serious waves. Sega had taken advantage of their competitors' adversarial relationship with third-party developers. For years, Nintendo had held developers hostage by rationing out lockout chips, without which games wouldn't play on the Famicom or NES. Because Nintendo sought absolute control over its products, it transformed itself into little more than a tyrant. Jeff Ryan, author of Super Mario How Nintendo Conquered America, explains how Sega leveraged Nintendo's bad behavior to their benefit. When Sega came out with the Genesis, so many third-party developers flocked to them just because Sega was treating their developers well and Nintendo was not. And Nintendo was able to do that because they were the only game in town. They had something like 92% market share. But when the Genesis came around and the Genesis started to gain speed, people realized, oh, finally, there's another heavyweight contender out there. There's someone else who can take on the Goliath. Sega churned out arcade ports and secured exclusive third-party releases, a side effect of a clause in Nintendo's contracts forbidding developers from making games for other consoles. One of the most important turned out to be the very first console version of Electronic Arts' new sports franchise, Madden NFL Football which earned huge sales during Christmas 1990. And in the following summer, Sega released their own homegrown killer app, a new high-speed platformer called Sonic the Hedgehog. Suddenly, Sega had their own Mario, but one with wild hair, a 90s tood, and the remarkable ability to finally threaten Nintendo's stranglehold on the American console market. But, of course, Nintendo had long been working on the NES's successor, the 16-bit follow-up was released in the fall of 1990 in Japan as the Super Famicom, and in summer 1991 in America as the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. The console came with Shigeru Miyamoto's most expansive and best-looking game yet, Super Mario World. Once again, Nintendo's pack and title helped move systems. According to Ryan's book, Super Mario World sold 3.5 million copies in Japan, while in the States, gamers bought 17 million. Three days after its U.S. launch, retailers had sold out of the Super Nintendo console. The SNES was a hit, but unlike its predecessor, it faced some fierce competition. Despite Super Mario World's brilliance, Sonic's rush onto the scene had suddenly made Nintendo seem… uncool. Sega seemed to represent everything that was hip and new in video games, while Nintendo looked safe, stodgy, and downright old. Even though 1991's SNES was technologically superior to 1988's Genesis in every way. By 1992, sources estimate the Genesis had a roughly 55% market share over its competitor. By 1993, cracks started appearing in Nintendo's public image. A big-budget Hollywood movie based on Super Mario Bros. starring Bob Hoskins, John Leguizamo, and Dennis Hopper was released that summer, to abysmal reviews and performance. What should have been Nintendo's ultimate triumph was a universally reviled public embarrassment. Today, Super Mario Bros. holds a place in cinematic history as not only one of the worst video game movie adaptations, but simply as one of the worst movies. Period. That wasn't the only problem Nintendo faced that year. In September, Acclaim published SNES and Genesis ports of Midway's ultra-violent arcade fighter, Mortal Kombat. But despite being 16-bit versions of the same game, the ports were anything but equal. The Genesis version featured just about every blood-splattering hit and spine-ripping fatality from the original. The SNES port, however, was heavily modified to reflect Nintendo's family-friendly policy. Fatalities were out, tamer finishing moves were in. Absurdly, brutal hits didn't result in sprays of blood, but sprays of grayish sweat. It's estimated that the Genesis version outsold Nintendo's by roughly 4 to 1 and the move did seemingly irreparable damage to Nintendo's reputation with gamers, as the company continues to fight the perception that it just makes games for kids. But the final tally of the first true console war between the Genesis and the SNES didn't seem to account for Nintendo's missteps. Though Sega never released data, estimates tally the Genesis's worldwide sales at about 29 million worldwide, not quite two-thirds of the Super Nintendo's 49.1 million global sales, when all is said and done, the SNES simply had the better games. Sega's ascendance forced Nintendo to allow multi-platform games from third parties. But Mortal Kombat aside, the Super Nintendo's superior hardware meant that, most of the time, games looked, sounded, and played better. Nintendo could also claim the support of one of Japan's top developers, Squaresoft, 
whose Final Fantasy series, The Secret of Mana, and Chrono Trigger were SNES exclusives and helped popularize the RPG genre in America. And besides Super Mario World, the SNES had an impressive roster of first-party games that became industry legends. Familiar titles like The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past and Super Metroid appeared, not to mention launch title F-Zero, the Super FX chip-powered Star Fox, and the genre-spawning Super Mario Kart. And that wasn't all. The company's decision to buy a 49% stake in British developer Rareware in 1994 proved to be nothing short of genius, as was releasing one of Nintendo's oldest properties from its closely guarded vault. That year, Rare and Nintendo released Donkey Kong Country, a platformer that had more in common with Super Mario Bros. than the 1981 arcade classic. But visually, Donkey Kong Country was like nothing else on the market. Its developers had animated pre-rendered 3D graphics as 2D sprites. The effect was a game that looked far more technologically advanced than it actually was. Donkey Kong Country sold over 8 million copies worldwide, becoming the second best-selling SNES game of all time. Donkey Kong had come full circle, having regained his rightful place as one of Nintendo's most recognizable and profitable characters. And like Donkey Kong, Nintendo was also regaining its position as top banana in the video game industry. Its reputation for first-class products and its first-class ego had seemed well-earned with the SNES's success. But just as its howdy prideful attitude with third parties had allowed Sega to swoop in, Nintendo's tradition of arrogant business decisions would prove that what goes around, comes around. By the mid-1990s, Nintendo had won the 16-bit console war against Sega. But that victory came at a cost. Its reputation faltered when it censored SNES ports of the ultra-violent and ultra-popular Mortal Kombat. More importantly, Nintendo lost its singular hold on third-party developers. Sega wooed many a way to make games for their Genesis, a seduction made easy by Nintendo's years of bullying developers into lopsided contracts. Nintendo's bad behavior led to the first major threat to its industry dominance since Donkey Kong catapulted the company to the top of the video game market. And more of Nintendo's misdeeds would come back to haunt them, as a former business partner would threaten all they had built. Nintendo would soon learn. Since 1988, Nintendo had been working with electronics giant Sony on a console that would play cartridges and CDs, a true multimedia game machine. But when the joint venture began, Nintendo was still the biggest fish in the relatively small video game pond. As the partnership progressed, it became clear that Nintendo didn't want to cede its complete control, and wanted even less to split the profits. Despite the unhappy marriage, work continued on the new device, culminating in a presentation at the Consumer Electronics Show in June 1991. The presentation showed off what had been dubbed the Nintendo PlayStation. On that day in June, Sony's future in the market looked bright. What a difference a day makes. A day after the PlayStation presentation, Nintendo announced it was breaking its contract with Sony, opting to go with its rival, Philips, instead. Philips had been working on its own CD-based game machine, the CDI, since 1984, bringing it to market later in 1991. Philips would make the CD-based add-on device for Nintendo's 16-bit consoles, not Sony. Little did Nintendo know, but it had created a monster. Sources say that Nintendo broke its contract with Sony because the two companies could never agree on how to divide the never-ending stream of cash the partnership would have made. Perhaps when the contract between the companies was signed in 1988, no one could predict how ubiquitous and important the CD-based medium would truly become. Signing a deal giving Sony more control and profit over CD-based manufacturing and sales, with Nintendo keeping control only over cartridges, may have seemed harmless at the time. But by 1991, it was clear that CDs and their enormous storage capacity were the future of media. Given control of manufacturing and distribution of CDs to Sony would have made Sony the heavy hitter in the relationship. Nintendo couldn't play second fiddle. Sony fumed at the betrayal and threatened lawsuits, but there were reasons to keep the attorneys at bay. For instance, Sony had supplied the Super Famicom with its sound chip. Eventually, cooler heads prevailed, but the years of work that had gone into the PlayStation would not be wasted. Company president Norio Oga insisted that the company continue its foray into the video game market. Sony had a competitor to crush. Meanwhile, Nintendo's new partnership with Philips didn't quite pan out. 
It's been speculated that Nintendo's About Face was an attempt to strong-arm Sony into a revised contract that would benefit Nintendo more. And Philips, it seemed, wanted its CDI media format to be the universal standard for all game-playing machines, an idea that didn't jibe with Nintendo's preference toward proprietary formats. Worse, Nintendo feared the ease of CD piracy, another potential revenue loss. Nintendo pulled out of that partnership too, but not without paying a price. As part of its agreement with Philips, Nintendo licensed some of its trademark characters to appear in CDI games. The result? Hotel Mario, Link, The Faces of Evil Zelda, The Wand of Gamelon, and Zelda's Adventure are known as some of the worst games to feature these characters. In fact, they're regarded as some of the worst games to feature any characters. Needless to say, the experience reinforced one valuable lesson for Nintendo. Keep control. While Nintendo dithered between partners, never releasing the CD playing expansion it had planned on since 1988, Sega had no such problems. The Mega CD expansion for the Mega Drive console was released in Japan in late 1991, with the Sega CD hitting North America the next year. Then, in 1994, Sega released the 32X, another add-on to expand the capabilities of the Genesis. But neither of these peripherals did much for Sega. The Genesis had still come up short to the SNES. As the underwhelming and underselling Sega CD proved, the world wasn't ready for CD-based gaming after all. And American consumers knew that the Sega Saturn, a true 32-bit console already a hit in Japan in 94, was set for a fall 1995 release, so they largely ignored the 32X. But when Sega made a surprise E3 announcement that the Saturn would launch in May, customers, retailers, and developers scratched their heads. Most developers were preparing for a fall launch, so there weren't that many games to buy. Meanwhile, Sony took the opportunity to cut the September launching PlayStation's price to $300, leaving the $400 Saturn to languish on the store shelves. Sega's four-month head start resulted in a mere 80,000 units sold, while the much-hyped PlayStation sold over 100,000 units in its first weekend. All the while, Nintendo waited. Their own next-gen console, the Ultra 64, had been in development since 1993, but by 1995, it wasn't ready yet. What was ready, however, was the Virtual Boy, a 32-bit portable device that offered gamers full 3D visuals, and also completely red visuals. Gunpei Yokoi had been developing the device with his team since 1991. Throughout that time, the Game Boy inventor struggled with the Virtual Boy's design and was reluctant for it to go to market. According to Jeff Ryan's book, Super Mario, How Nintendo Conquered America, Yokoi wanted to wait until including full-color visuals was more affordable. Nintendo's president, Hiroshi Yamauchi, however, wanted a new product on the market while the Ultra 64 matured. The Virtual Boy launched in the summer of 1995. It was quietly discontinued less than a year later, having only moved 770,000 units worldwide. The failure made Yokoi a pariah within Nintendo. Yokoi helped develop the Game Boy Pocket, then retired from the company and began consulting. However, Nintendo would never benefit from Yokoi's genius again. In 1997, he was killed in a tragic car accident. It's not clear whether Nintendo's troubles truly began with Yokoi's departure, or if Yokoi's exit was merely a symptom of Nintendo's bigger problems. But when Nintendo released its next generation console, now called the Nintendo 64, in 1996, it wasn't the dominating force its predecessors had been. The N64 launched to very strong sales. In four months in North America, it sold 400,000 units, far outstripping the Saturn's dismal performance. Its $200 launch price was a full $100 less than Sony's PlayStation, but the N64's affordability was diminished due to the high cost of its games, a whopping $70 per cartridge. Fortunately, one of the system's best-loved and most successful launch titles, Super Mario 64, was more than worth the price of admission. Nintendo's resident genius, Shigeru Miyamoto, had done it again, reinventing Mario in a way that was both brand new and comfortably familiar. For the first time, Mario existed in a deep, fully three-dimensional world, freed from the flat lands of 2D side-scrolling. Miyamoto had packed 13 enormous levels full of exploration, taking a page out of the Zelda playbook. To complete the game, players rooted through every nook and cranny in an effort to find all the stars and coins that they could. But Miyamoto's game was part of the reason the N64 was delayed a year, 
Originally, he'd wanted to include 40 levels in the game. In fact, some of the elements he couldn't fit into Super Mario 64 appeared in The Legend of Zelda The Ocarina of Time, which was released two years later in 1998. Both games were considered masterpieces, as were many of the other first-party games Nintendo published. Star Fox 64 and Mario Kart 64 were enormous expansions of the original SNES titles, while new franchises like Super Smash Bros. and Mario Party found popularity of their own. And Rare, the studio behind the SNES smash Donkey Kong Country, delivered another critical hit for the system in 1997. GoldenEye 007, which sold more than 8 million copies and offered what seemed impossible, a great first-person shooter on a console. GoldenEye paved the way for the torrent of console first-person shooters that have followed. And best of all, GoldenEye was an N64 exclusive. But amid Nintendo's successes, there was a critical piece of the puzzle missing. Third parties. The reason? Cartridges. As game makers continued to up the ante with cinematic visuals and sound, it was apparent that CDs were the best medium for the job. They were inexpensive to manufacture and held tons of data. While cartridges could load more quickly, they held a fraction of the data of discs. Sega and Sony understood the CD's benefits, while Nintendo only saw drawbacks. None more frightening than piracy. Developers didn't share Nintendo's fears and started pulling their support in search of easier development and higher profits. The avalanche started with Squaresoft, which had previously enjoyed a lucrative partnership with Nintendo on the SNES console. While the two companies had thrived together, Square was expanding its scope, and its next project, Final Fantasy VII, was shaping up to be epic. But such a large game would never fit on a cartridge. The choice for Square was clear. In 1997, Final Fantasy VII launched for the Sony PlayStation. The game was a monster hit, selling over 10 million copies, popularizing the RPG genre among American gamers, and making plenty of money for Sony. Soon, most third-party developers had flocked to the PlayStation, leaving Nintendo fans to wait for more appearances from Mario and the rest of the gang. Nintendo's stubbornness had finally taken its toll. When the smoke cleared, the N64 was certainly a very popular console, having sold 32.93 million units worldwide by the end of its life cycle. It had easily trounced longtime rival Sega, whose Saturn only ever sold 9.5 million units. But neither could touch the PlayStation, which sold over 102 million consoles worldwide, becoming the first video game console to break the 100 million mark. Nintendo was no longer number one, having been relegated to a distant second. And with the release of their next console, a distant second might have looked pretty good. The 1990s concluded with Nintendo feeling triumph and defeat. Its N64 console easily trounced the Sega Saturn system in sales and popularity. But both systems had their clocks cleaned by the 100 million selling Sony PlayStation a system that owed its existence to Nintendo having commissioned its creation, and Sony's thirst for revenge after Nintendo's backhanded business dealings. And while Nintendo's Super Mario 64 was hailed as nothing short of revolutionary, third-party developers had left for Sony's greener pastures, leaving the N64 with mostly first-party hits. As the new millennium approached, Nintendo would struggle to reclaim its status at the top of the industry, an industry that was getting pretty crowded. Soon, a fourth participant in the console war would enter the fray, leaving Nintendo feeling... While the N64 wasn't a runaway hit, Nintendo maintained a firm grip on the handheld market with the 8-bit Game Boy, thanks in large part to another trademark first-party franchise. But it wasn't Mario, Zelda, or even Donkey Kong. It was Pokémon, and it was a worldwide phenomenon. Pokémon was the brainchild of Satoshi Tajiri, who had learned the ways of simple yet addictive game design from Nintendo's resident expert, Shigeru Miyamoto. Released in 1995 in Japan, Pokemon's premise was summed up in its catchphrase, gotta catch them all. Players roamed the land searching for every single type of over a hundred different Pokemon, battling rival trainers or collectors along the way. The kids of Japan took the slogan to heart, and within two years, Pokemon sold 10.4 million copies, it spawned an anime series as well, which made global headlines in 1997 when over 600 Japanese kids were admitted to hospitals after suffering seizures, apparently induced by a Pokemon episode's flashing colors. The bizarre incident wasn't enough to keep Pokemon from reaching America in 1998. 
Just as they had dominated in Japan, the game and show found near instantaneous success in the United States and managed to sell almost 10 million copies. Even though Game Boy had been around for nearly a decade, the console flourished with a whole new generation of kids. In 1998, Nintendo finally released the Game Boy Color. Two years later, Pokemon sequels transfixed kids again. But by 2001, the Game Boy had begun to show its age. Nintendo took the next step releasing a 16-bit upgrade, the Game Boy Advance. The first version of the console had survived for 12 years before it was replaced, and even hung around for another two years before finally racking up almost 120 million units sold. In the meantime, competitors had come and gone. The Game Gear, Lynx, TurboGrafx Express, Neo Geo Pocket Color, and the Wonder Swan, a Bandai-made system that owed its creation to Game Boy's own inventor, the late Gunpei Yokoi all fell before the Game Boy's might. If only Nintendo's other video game ventures were so mighty. Meanwhile, Sega's newest console, the Dreamcast, was released in November 1998 to a tepid response in Japan. Its American launch in September of the following year, on the other hand, was a smash, selling over half a million consoles in just two weeks. Sega finally had another hit on its hands. Until, of course, Sony released its own next-gen console, the PlayStation 2, in 2000. Just as the first PlayStation wiped the floor with its competition, Sony's PS2 erupted onto the scene, moving nearly a million units in Japan in one day. The Dreamcast's one-year head start didn't matter. Third parties pulled Dreamcast support, flocking to the PS2. But by March 2001, Sega threw in the towel, announcing their exit from the console business to focus exclusively on software. In fact, later that year, two Sega games would be launch titles for Nintendo's newest console. But if consumers mourned the loss of Sega in 2001, they didn't grieve long. Nintendo's newest system, the GameCube, would launch on November 18th. And if that weren't enough, another tech giant was barging into the video game market to take Sega's place. Microsoft's Xbox was scheduled to launch a mere three days before the GameCube. The latest console war had begun. Sony's PlayStation 2 was the clear frontrunner, considering its growing catalog of hit games after a year on the market, a built-in DVD player, and its backwards compatibility with the original PlayStation's game library. The new challenger, Microsoft's Xbox, had plenty to offer as well, like its own DVD player, an internal hard drive, and an integrated Ethernet adapter for high-speed online gaming. The GameCube came in purple or black, and had a little handle so you could carry it. In many ways, this was an unfair fight. Microsoft had the capital to brute force its way into the console market, a move Sony used a generation before with the PlayStation. Sony and Microsoft both had enough money pouring in through their other divisions to offset the costs of entering the video game market cold. Even selling feature-packed consoles at a loss was manageable for Nintendo's competitors. Nintendo, by contrast, made only games. How could it hope to compete against two big-spending tech giants with virtually unlimited wallets? The GameCube's North American launch still managed to impress, however. Priced $100 lower than the competition, the GameCube moved over a half a million units in its first week on shelves. But Microsoft kept pace with Nintendo. The Xbox sold out of its supply of 300,000 units after its first week. When it came to playing actual games, not DVDs, the GameCube was on a pretty level playing field with the PlayStation 2 and Xbox and having learned how toxic cartridges had become to developers, Nintendo made the switch to discs. While the Xbox and PS2 ran on full-size 12cm CDs and DVDs, with capacity upwards of 85 gigabytes of data, Nintendo commissioned Panasonic to create special proprietary mini-DVD discs. Like the N64 cartridges, the mini-DVD format was company president Hiroshi Yamauchi's solution for foiling would-be game pirates. The discs measured at 8 centimeters, but only offered 1.5 gigabytes of data capacity. For many game makers, this was plenty of space. But for developers pushing the generation's technical limits, the mini-DVD presented problems. Bigger games required more than one disc to play, and some cross-platform titles required video and audio to be more compressed, or for some features to be omitted from the GameCube ports entirely. While these technical limitations may not have been enough to doom the console, the actual system's physical design seemed a clear signal to gamers. The purple cube, the lunchbox handle, the bizarre controller with bean-shaped buttons, and the baby-sized game disc signified that Nintendo wasn't making real games for real gamers. Nintendo had reinforced its reputation as safe, kid-friendly, and extremely uncool. 
Of course, the GameCube still boasted some amazing titles that couldn't be found anywhere else. At launch, LucasArts and Factor 5 offered up Star Wars Rogue Leader, a space combat game set around the classic Star Wars trilogy that blew gamers away with fantastic visuals and top-notch action. A few weeks after GameCube's launch, Nintendo released its latest Shigeru Miyamoto title, a new real-time strategy franchise called Pikmin. It quickly established itself as a Nintendo staple, selling over a million copies. A month after the console's launch, Nintendo released Super Smash Bros. Melee, the sequel to its homegrown fighter that pitted its trademark characters in four-way combat. Melee became the GameCube's best-selling title with over 7 million copies. And in 2002, Nintendo ported a late-cycle Japanese N64 game, Animal Crossing, to the GameCube, a decision that won tons of critical praise and establishing yet another lucrative franchise for the company's family of consoles. And in 2002, Nintendo released Metroid Prime, a radical reworking of Gunpei Yokoi's side-scrolling franchise. Created by Retro Studios, a second-party developer in Austin, Texas, Metroid Prime helped combat Nintendo's kids-only vibe by reinventing the series as a thrilling first-person shooter. The new direction was a critical hit, feeling at once familiar and utterly brand new. Prime is remembered as one of the best, most highly praised games of the generation. But there were glaring omissions from the GameCube's lineup. For one, where was Mario? For the first time ever, Nintendo's home console didn't have a game featuring Mario at launch. What consumers got instead was Luigi's Mansion, which ditched the running, jumping, and stomping. In their place was a vacuum cleaner that sucked ghosts. But despite praise from critics, longtime Nintendo fans thought that the vacuum wasn't all that sucked about Luigi's Mansion. Mario did finally get his own game about a half a year later. Super Mario Sunshine was released in summer 2002, and, like Luigi's Mansion, gave Mario a contraption that augmented the familiar mechanics fans had grown to love. Instead of a ghost-sucking vacuum, Mario had a water-spraying hose, with which he cleaned up graffiti on a tropical island. Once again, critics praised Super Mario Sunshine, but some wondered why Nintendo was gussying up their mascots with all the gimmicky gadgets. Other longtime Nintendo franchises got similarly reworked, pushing hardcore gamers away in droves. Star Fox Adventures in 2002 was a third-person action game, bringing Fox McCloud out of the stars and onto the ground. Though developed by Nintendo's hitmaker Rare, Star Fox Adventures didn't have nearly the impact of Donkey Kong Country and GoldenEye 007. Even worse, Microsoft shelled out a cool $375 million to purchase Rare outright, a mere one day after Star Fox Adventures' North American release. That wasn't all, though. When the new installment of Miyamoto's other long-running franchise was unveiled, many fans considered it the final nail in the coffin. In 2003, Nintendo released The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. It was as good a Zelda game as any, if not the best one yet. But visually, Wind Waker once again reinforced claims that the GameCube was merely a toy. Link and the Kingdom of Hyrule were rendered in cel-shaded style, a visual effect that made games look like interactive cartoons. The revelation was made worse by the fact that in 2000, Nintendo showed off a demo reel featuring a dark and gritty version of Zelda. Wind Waker was a hit among critics and fans who remained loyal to Nintendo, selling 4.6 million copies. But if the company was trying to fight its family's first image, this didn't help. In the end, the GameCube wasn't a failure for Nintendo, but it was the closest the company had come to defeat since entering the video game market two decades earlier. The PlayStation 2 was the unquestionable king of the hill, having sold 141 million units worldwide. Though the final tally for the Xbox and the GameCube revealed that they finished neck and neck, the Xbox still beat out the industry veteran, selling 24 million to Nintendo's 22 million. Nintendo had slipped from its second place status to a dismal third. Some believed this was the end of Nintendo's console making days. Why not leave consoles to the big boys? Why not just make great games for other systems, like Sega was doing? The argument made a certain sense. But on the other hand, Nintendo's successes came by following its own path. No, the secret to reclaiming success wasn't as elusive as it seemed. For its next console, Nintendo would take its cues from the consumers it sought to reclaim. If you don't like what you're playing, there's one simple solution. Change the game. All was not well in the house of Mario. Nintendo's latest home video game console, the GameCube, failed to find the same kind of dominance the company had enjoyed in the 80s and early 90s. While the company's name was once synonymous with video games, Nintendo's missteps and inability to change with the times had left it with a battered reputation. 
it was seen as out of touch and geared only towards Pokemon-loving kids. Gamers who consider themselves serious or hardcore turned their noses up at Nintendo's offering, and the result was a severely reduced market share. Their one-time rival Sega left the console business altogether to focus on software, a business shift many critics thought Nintendo should follow. But reinvention was a part of Nintendo's DNA. Though it may have had a tin ear when it came to listening to fans, Nintendo always heard the beat of its own drummer loud and clear. Soon, the company would outsell its competition and find its way back into the good graces and living rooms of gamers the world over. Hiroshi Yamauchi had been the president of Nintendo since 1949, molding and shaping the company for more than half a century. Under Yamauchi's leadership, Nintendo grew from a regionally successful playing card company into a global entertainment powerhouse. But shortly after the GameCube's 2001 launch, Yamauchi knew it was time to step down. His son-in-law, Minoru Arakawa, retired as president of Nintendo of America in 2002. Though many thought Arakawa would succeed his father-in-law, it seemed the former Nintendo of America president was happy to leave the industry altogether after 22 years. These two men shaped Nintendo's two-decade transformation, and whoever followed would have their work cut out for them. By 2002, the GameCube was running third in the latest console war, beaten in worldwide sales by Sony's PlayStation 2 and Microsoft's first video game effort, the Xbox. For the vacancy to the top of Nintendo of America, Yamauchi appointed Tatsumi Kimishima, the former head of the company's Pokemon division. Though Tatsumi would be supplanted by Reggie fils a mere four years later. For his own replacement, Yamauchi appointed Satoru Iwata, the president of Nintendo's second-party developer, HAL Laboratories. Since acquiring a majority stake in the studio, Nintendo enjoyed a healthy relationship with HAL, which was responsible for some of Nintendo's biggest franchise successes. Kirby, Earthbound, and Super Smash Bros. all came from HAL Laboratories and proved to be worthy additions to Nintendo's lineup. In 2000, Yamauchi brought Iwata over from HAL to become Nintendo's head of corporate planning. Unbeknownst to Iwata, Yamauchi had hired him to see if he could be a worthy successor. In 2002, after stepping down as president, but staying on as chairman of Nintendo's board of directors, Yamauchi kept a close watch on Iwata to see if he was right. Iwata's first true test came in November 2004. The company was rolling out a new twist on an old favorite, the handheld DS console. Standing for dual screen, the DS took its design cues from a popular iteration of Gunpei Yokoi's old Game & Watch LCD toys, which featured two screens packaged in a hinged clamshell design. But instead of simply giving players a case of double vision, the DS's bottom half was actually a touchscreen. This opened the door for developers to create all new ways to interact with games, an innovation devised by Yamauchi before his exit. The DS included a Wi-Fi adapter, meaning that gamers could play online and even browse the web at Wi-Fi hotspots. After years of flirting with online connectivity with the original Famicom, the SNES's Japan-only Satellaview, and the limited GameCube broadband adapter, Nintendo finally went all in. The DS's solid core of features and its new wave of casual-minded games, like Shigeru Miyamoto's smash hit Nintendogs, helped make the DS a tremendous success among longtime gamers, businessmen with time to kill, and, most significantly, girls and women. It proved to be a true successor to the Game Boy brand's legacy. Despite competition from Sony's handheld 2005's PSP, the DS has sold over 152 million units worldwide to date. But dominating the handheld market was simply Nintendo maintaining the status quo. After all, the Game Boy managed to last for over 12 years with barely a threat to its place in gamers' pockets. The true battle for video game supremacy was being waged at home. In the fall of 2005, Microsoft launched its second console, the Xbox 360, selling out initial shipments due to overwhelming consumer demand. Sony, which had gotten a year's head start with the PlayStation 2 to dominating effect, was planning to release the PlayStation 3 in November 2006. Meanwhile, Nintendo would be launching its own new console, codenamed The Revolution, a few days after that. History, it seemed, would be repeating itself. And even worse, as gamers and journalists learned more details about the console, its simple remote, its gimmicky motion controls, and its baffling new name, the Wii, the reaction wasn't revolution, but confusion. But as the Wii's release date drew near, excitement about Nintendo's new console began to grow among the gaming media. The system promised a brand new way to play video games, a claim Nintendo had already fulfilled once with the DS and its unique touchscreen. 
While Microsoft and Sony pushed the technological envelope in terms of audio-visual spectacle, the Wii stripped the gaming experience down to basics. Every console generation to this point seemed to slap more buttons and analog sticks onto an increasingly convoluted controller. The idea of actually playing a game was lost amid the complexity. Speaking of complex, Sony's PlayStation 3 was suffering for the reasons its predecessor had excelled. The system didn't just play games in DVDs, it included an expensive built-in Blu-ray player and online connectivity. Its beefy hardware specs were powerful and impressive, but resulted in sticker shock, costing $499 for the most basic model. The Wii was puny by comparison, but with an equally puny price of $249 to match, not to mention always-on Wi-Fi capability of its own. The Wii also boasted backwards compatibility with the GameCube's library, as well as a robust online store full of classic titles from its earlier systems, not to mention plenty of games from the Sega Genesis and NEC's TurboGrafx-16. Though its online gaming options weren't nearly as sophisticated as those found in the PS3 and the Xbox 360, the Wii offered enough bells and whistles for the casual gamers just looking to have fun. By the time the Wii and the PS3 launched in November 2006, people had received Nintendo's message loud and clear. The Wii sold out immediately and became that year's hottest holiday gift. For months after its release, the Wii was difficult to find all around the world despite the company manufacturing 1.6 million units a month throughout 2007. By 2008, Nintendo began manufacturing 2.4 million units a month in an effort to keep up with how quickly the system was selling out worldwide. Nintendo was simply unable to meet the overwhelming demand that had emerged for the console, which was finding its place in living rooms and senior rec centers all around the country. The Wii was being touted by the media as a new way to stay active and healthy, somewhat dubious claims Nintendo never promised, but never dispelled either. By September 2007, not even a year after its release, the Wii overtook the Xbox 360 in worldwide sales, boasting 9 million units sold to Microsoft's 8.9 million. Meanwhile, the PS3 lived up to its name, taking third place with 3.7 million units sold. The Wii had quickly turned Nintendo's fortunes around, transforming what was once perceived as Nintendo's weakness, an emphasis on family fun, into its strength. Anyone could pick up a Wii remote and figure out how to play. The concept was best illustrated in the Wii's pack-in title, Wii Sports, which featured five different motion-controlled, sports-inspired minigames, ranging from bowling to boxing to baseball. To swing the bat, all you had to do was swing the remote. To return a serve in tennis, just do your best Serena Williams impression. These were video games people could understand intuitively, no complicated instructions required. Wii Sports was so successful that it broke the record for highest selling video game of all time, a title previously held by Super Mario Bros. for 18 years. To date, Wii Sports has sold nearly 80 million copies. But while the Wii was undoubtedly a hit with a newly emerging class of casual gamer, many hardcore gamers were placated with another launch title, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Finally, Nintendo made good in its long, unfulfilled promise of a more mature Zelda. It also featured motion controls for attacks. The innovative controls were a hit, and Twilight Princess sold 5.8 million copies by 2011, earning several Game of the Year awards. Was Nintendo just for kids and moms? Hardly. Mario took his time showing up on the Wii, finally appearing in Super Mario Galaxy a year after the system's launch. But it was worth the wait. Galaxy was an instant smash. Like Super Mario 64 had done before it, Galaxy brought a new and exciting gameplay mechanic to the franchise. The action was set in space on small, interconnected planets, each with their own gravitational pulls. And best of all, there wasn't a water hose in sight. Super Mario Galaxy sold over 10 million copies by March 2012 and earned several Game of the Year awards in 2007. But as popular as the Wii had become with gamers and old folks alike, developers weren't all quite as enamored. As the system matured, it became clearer that only Nintendo fully understood the secret recipe that made the Wii so appealing. Many third-party games couldn't figure out how to successfully utilize the console's motion controls. Other games didn't even bother, and the Wii was plagued with endless shovelware and half-baked, underpowered ports of other titles. One developer working at EA famously announced at the Game Developers Conference in 2007 that the Wii was nothing more than, quote, two GameCubes stuck together with duct tape. But no matter how upset developers might have been, the numbers didn't lie. By September 2012, the Wii had sold 97.18 million units, 
while the PS3 and Xbox 360 were neck and neck with roughly 70 million units sold for each. The system was a hit, and Nintendo was back on top. The Wii never could stand up to the horsepower of the Xbox 360 and PS3, but neither competitor could boast the Wii's intuitive and unique motion controls, though they tried. In 2010, both Sony and Microsoft launched their own takes on the Wii's motion-based gaming, the PlayStation Move and the Xbox Connect. Once again, Nintendo had transformed the industry, and its rivals were scrambling to keep up. Nintendo was king of the hill once more. After five years of enjoying its reclaimed market dominance, the company planned to wow the world again with its latest device, a giant leap in handheld gaming technology over its wildly successful DS console. What could go wrong? In a word, everything. The Wii was a return to form for Nintendo, rocketing the company straight to the top of the video game market. It easily outpaced the competition in sales, racking up nearly 100 million in console sales over the course of six years. It also featured some of the company's most exciting and innovative first-party games yet. But for every great Nintendo-made Wii game, there were at least three forgettable third-party titles. The system was plagued with inferior ports, low-selling exclusives, or straight-up shovelware. Nintendo had captured the hearts and living rooms of families around the globe, while the Wii left a bad taste in the mouths of so-called real video gamers. So how could Nintendo keep the casual audience it had won with the Wii, but recapture the hardcore gamers who felt buyers Wii Morse? Could the two factions come together once more? Even before Nintendo's success with the Wii console, the company had dominated the handheld market for two decades. The Game Boy was the champion of mobile gaming for over 10 years, while the Game Boy Advance and DS systems kept Nintendo's hot streak alive. So when its next handheld gaming system was unveiled at E3 in 2010, it seemed like a surefire winner. The 3DS was exactly what it sounded like, a more powerful version of the DS console with 3D visuals, without the use of annoying glasses. A year before in 2009, James Cameron's big-budget spectacle Avatar had ushered in a frenzy of interest in 3D movies and television. Electronics manufacturers cranked out 3D-capable TVs while blockbuster movies were converted for 3D screenings. The 3DS's promise of glasses-free 3D visuals seemed like the perfect gadget at the perfect time. When the system launched in the spring of 2011, it seemed as though Nintendo had done it again. The 3DS sold out of its initial shipment of 400,000 during its release in Japan. Nintendo of America announced that the 3DS's US launch had set a record for the highest first day sales of any of the company's previous devices. But soon after, interest in the 3DS slowed to a crawl. Nintendo had hoped to ship at least 4 million consoles by the end of March, but fell short with only 3.61 million. By June, sales in Japan finally crossed the 1 million mark a shocking reversal of fortune considering the DS had managed the feat in a mere four weeks. Only a few months after its launch, developers were announcing delays for their 3DS games, citing slow system sales. What had gone wrong? To start, Nintendo overestimated the public's hunger for a 3D-enabled gaming system. The 3DS's high launch price of $250 didn't help either. And despite promises of three-dimensional ROMs through familiar Nintendo titles, there were only three first-party launch games, Pilot Wings Resort, Steel Diver, and Nintendogs and Cats. But above all, there was one unseen factor that stalled the 3DS's sales. The iPhone. Apple's take on smartphones revolutionized the mobile technology industry. Sure, in the mid-2000s, everyone had a cell phone, but they also had separate MP3 players, GPS navigators, cameras, and gaming machines. When the iPhone hit in 2007, it sent shockwaves through the tech world, condensing all those devices and more into one sleek, fashionable gadget. Smartphones weren't for businessmen anymore. They were for everyone. And Apple's secret weapon? The App Store, full of colorful, addictive games ranging in price from $3 to $1 to flat out free. Who needed Mario when he could play Angry Birds on the bus? While the 3DS was a huge leap forward for Nintendo's handhelds, its $40 games and inability to make phone calls made it seem like a throwback. With the 3DS stalling out only months after its launch, suddenly Nintendo's success with the Wii appeared less like a return to form and more like a temporary fluke. Once again, critics, analysts, and even Nintendo's investors pressured Nintendo to leave the hardware game and bring Mario and Pokemon to mobile phones. Once again, Nintendo went its own way but not before taking some drastic steps. In July 2011, Nintendo announced a dramatic 3DS price cut, 
dropping over 30% from $250 to $170 after only five months on the market. Even worse, the slow sales forced Nintendo to cut that year's profit projections by over 80%. The announcement caused Nintendo's stock price to tumble 12% on July 29th. Former Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi, the company's largest stockholder, lost over $300 million in one day. Nothing like this had ever happened during his half-century as president. His successor, Satoru Iwata, took full responsibility for the dire turn of events, giving himself a 50% pay cut. To many, this looked like the end. Amazingly, though, it wasn't. When it was first announced, the price cut looked like a desperate move to temporarily delay Nintendo's imminent collapse. But sales of the 3DS actually did begin to climb. Soon first-party games like Mario Kart 7, Super Mario 3D Land, and Kid Icarus Uprising started to appear. Delayed third-party games made their way to stores as 3DS ownership grew across the world. By September 2012, the 3DS's sales had reached 22.19 million keeping close pace with the sales of its predecessor for the same period of time. It turned out that people were perfectly happy with Mario staying off the iPhone, as long as the price was right. Meanwhile, Sony followed up its PSP in early 2012 with the PlayStation Vita. Like the 3DS, its first few months on the market were rough, but unlike the 3DS, its $250 plus price tag remained the same, spending the majority of its first year struggling to find its audience. Even still, the damage to Nintendo was done. It ended its fiscal year 2011 with its first ever full year loss. While it would be easy to blame the 3DS's slow start and the money lost in its price cut, the reality wasn't so simple. External factors like Japan's back-to-back -back natural disasters and an unusually strong yen to dollar amplified Nintendo's financial woes. But the point had been made. Nintendo could still sell a handheld system, even in the face of Apple's unstoppable iPhone. So. Could it sell a home console to casual fans and hardcore gamers at the same time? To find out, Nintendo devised a follow-up to its mega-popular Wii console called the Wii U. First unveiled during E3 2011, the Wii U finally brought high-definition visuals to Nintendo's games. And it utilized one of the company's more successful innovations, the dual screen and touch control dynamics from the DS handheld. The Wii U also took advantage of its predecessor's huge install base, including backwards compatibility with not only Wii games, but also Wii remotes. But that wasn't all. The gamepad featured traditional button layouts, two analog sticks, built-in accelerometers, a microphone, a front-facing camera, speakers. It seemed like the new device promised to do everything but your taxes. The HD visuals represented Nintendo embracing the future. The Wii compatibility represented Nintendo's commitment to casual gamers and families. But the gamepad? That was a mystery. The Wii U's announcement wasn't embraced with the enthusiasm that Nintendo needed. Journalists were mystified by what they saw, a result of the console's physical similarities to the original Wii. The new name didn't help. Was the Wii U just an add-on for the Wii? Did the gamepad connect with the old system? What kind of leap forward was a touchscreen controller anyway? Investors were similarly nonplussed. Nintendo's stock dipped nearly 10% two days after the Wii U's E3 debut. While the company's fortunes improved over the next few months with the 3DS price cut, the Wii U remained a question mark in the year leading up to the console's late 2012 release. But as journalists had a chance to try out the new system, many started singing its praises. The Wii U's potential to transform video games, new dynamics between players, immersive interactive mechanics, started to seem less like promises and more like reality. The opinion among developers remained divided, however. Some derided the new system in its current-gen visual and processing specs. Other developers, though, were fully on board. Ubisoft was releasing Wii U-exclusive titles like Zombie U and Rayman Legends that seemed to take full advantage of the gamepad. And Gearbox Software's Randy Pitchford said, quote, This is the best controller Nintendo's ever made for making an FPS. This is the best controller Nintendo has ever given us for playing hardcore games. The Wii U was released in North America on November 18, 2012 selling out of its initial shipment of 400,000 units in its first week on the shelves. By all accounts, the Wii U would be another hit. But then, the original Wii and 3DS both enjoyed red-hot launches with deeply divergent results. It's not yet clear what the future holds for the Wii U. With its price starting at $300, Nintendo was selling the console at a loss, another first for the company. Though Nintendo of America president Reggie Philomie claimed that the sale of a console and one game made the device profitable. 
By the end of 2012, Nintendo's future seemed unclear. The 3DS was at the top of the handheld market, and for the first time since the launch of the original Nintendo Entertainment System, the company was first to market with a next-generation console. Will the Wii U be another Dreamcast, destined to enjoy a brief victory before getting crushed under the competition? Or has Nintendo once again changed the game industry into something new and unpredictable? Looking at Nintendo's competition did offer up some clues about its impact on the industry. In 2012, Microsoft introduced Smart Glass, an app designed to integrate gamers' smartphones and tablets with the aging Xbox 360 hardware. Similarly, Sony began talking up the cross-platform functionality between the Vita and the PS3. Like the Wii having inspired the Kinect and PS Move, it seemed as though Nintendo's Wii U encouraged its rivals to imitate its innovations once again. No matter what happens with the Wii U, Nintendo has had a greater influence on the video games industry than any other company before or since it entered the industry. In terms of business, Nintendo's first home console created a business model the industry has embraced and internalized. And though it didn't invent the video game medium, Nintendo perfected it. And the games it creates blaze trails of innovation and creativity that have never been matched. The proof is in the record books. Super Mario Bros. held the record for the highest-selling video game of all time for a staggering 18 years. And when the record did finally fall, it was due to, what else? Another Nintendo game, Wii Sports. From its humble beginnings as a playing card manufacturer in Kyoto over 100 years ago, to its status today as a worldwide symbol of games and fun, Nintendo will undoubtedly find a way to live on for generations to come. Super Mario, Link, Pokemon, and the rest aren't merely mascots for a video game company. They're modern icons that represent new realms of excitement to explore. For over 30 years in the video game market, Nintendo has left luck to heaven, and will likely never stop making plenty of luck on its own.